Are you insured, Eva? <laughs> Thank you so much for the blessing of the song. Let's pray together one more time. Father, as we move into this part of our service, we just continue to invite your presence. And at this time, Lord, we want to soften our thoughts and open our hearts and to receive your message for us. I pray that your servant would be used in your hands. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, where's Toby? Where's my son? This is a problem. Are you hiding? Where are you? Oh, you're the one that said you'd help me. Now you're hiding. Continue on in my series about faith matters and the Sabbath. Mitch, you want to help as well? Good. Um, I I'll, I'll just have a few comments if you can just hang out for a moment before we get to the, the kids' quiz. Um, how many of you are kind of... Some, I know to some people, they don't really get into the news and stuff like that. Any of you kind of glued to your, your news and TV uh, about mid of this week? Um, you know, I was. I mean, it's a pretty significant thing that for the first time in history, a nuclear power has overtly engaged in combat um, with a neighboring country. And uh, it should make us stand up and take note. And there's a, a temptation to some degree to say, um, well, maybe we shouldn't... Uh, continue business as normal, and, and maybe we should, uh, you know, revisit or, or think of things that may have more import. And my entire plan up, uh, for this series was to include the topic of the Sabbath in this series right now. And as I prayed about it, I thought uh, that the Lord really revealed to me that this is the perfect time to talk about the Sabbath. Um, and I want to just give you a couple of, of reasons why. Um, as people of faith, of people of prophecy, we believe that the Sabbath is not just a belief that is unique to us and fun and something that we cherish, but we feel that it has deep, significant uh, reality in the last days. Notice this comment from the Bible commentary. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, there will be united in opposition of God's people, all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath, of the fourth commandment will be the great point at issue for the Sabbath commandment, uh, for in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of the heavens and the earth. As Seventh-day Adventists, uh, we believe that the Sabbath is a last day issue. It is a warfare issue. Maybe not so much a warfare of tanks and missiles and bullets, uh, but it is significantly a warfare of the mind, uh, a warfare of the heart. And um, so I would like to uh, consider that as world events transpire, that as significant as they are, we should pray and we should uh, uh, support and think about those who are being affected uh, by the tragedies of this life. It should not at the same time distract us from the greater issues of our world, which is what is happening um, with our faith and what the devil wants to do to destroy people's confidence and relationship with him. Notice also Daniel talked about this. Speaking of the great oppression of God's people in the last days and that how the saints would be attacked and uh, the little horn power, the symbolic last power, shall think to change times in the law. Now, this isn't man's law he's going to change. This is a, uh, the, the little horn is going to try to change the law of God. And, and we've mentioned throughout the series, Revelation 12, 17, that also talks about how in the last days, the dragon will make war with those who keep the commandments of God. Did you know that Ukraine is the Bible belt of Europe? Did you know that there are more Seventh-day Adventists in Ukraine than in almost any other country in Europe? It is not, I don't think, just uh, uh, by chance that it's one of the most Christianized countries that is facing the challenges that they're going through right now. Now, I'm not saying it would be okay if they were atheist or Muslim or, or some other thing like that. It would still be a tragedy. But I think it's interesting that in many ways, Ukraine is the Adventist hub of ministry in Eastern Europe. Ukraine sends missionaries into other countries around them. 
As a matter of fact, I'm, some, some may have to correct me on this. If I, may not, I may be mistaken, but I have a memory uh, that, that I haven't been able to confirm. I'm pretty sure one of the previous presidents of Ukraine was, for all intents and purposes, a Seventh-day Adventist. So um, it is interesting that the devil in the last days uh, has his way of suppressing all peoples, but especially people of faith who are trying to get God's last day message out to the world. So I do believe it's appropriate to continue our journey of studying the significance of our faith and how the Sabbath plays into that. Okay, to my trained microphone technicians, I want to have my kids quiz this morning. How many times, I mentioned this last Sabbath, how many times does the number seven appear in the book of Revelation? I, saw, I actually saw Ryden put his hand up, so uh, no favoritism here. He was just ready to go. Just because just you got baptized, don't make it think that you're going to get favoritism. No. 50. 55. I got that last question last Sabbath, and I... See, it, you it, come yeah. and you hear it, and then we have this tie-in. So, good, you're paying attention. That's right. 55 times, 22 chapters in Revelation, and the number seven just over and over emphasized, illustrated, uh, exemplified in the book of Revelation. That's very interesting. So, thinking of all those references, which one of these does not belong in the book of Revelation? Seven stars, seven unicorns, seven churches, seven lamps, seven spirits. All right, Sebastian, are you wanting to handle this one? Seven unicorns. You, didn't you read in Reve where it talks about seven unicorns? You didn't read that part? You're right. You're right. There are not seven unicorns in the book. There are lots of horns, and there are crowns and things like that, but uh, no, no seven unicorns. Very good. Okay, one more. Again, which one does not belong? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven kings, or the seven samurai. I actually saw this young man's hand, and I've, I haven't got the kids' names yet, Jaylene. I apologize. It, Dylan, thank you. Seven thunders? It's not the seven thunders. Now, that's a, a good question, or a, a good answer. Okay? Um, go ahead. Right here. Sure. Yeah. Seven samurais. Seven samurai? You are right. There are not seven samurai in the book of Revelation. Uh, it may be one of the greatest movies ever made, but uh, 1954, The Seven Samurai. Nathan, you know that movie. It's one of your favorites. It's in your library, right? Akira Kurosara, um, 1954, Seven Samurai. Where's JR? Okay, tell me you know that movie. Okay, you say you like, you can't be a true lover of Jap Japanese culture if you don't know The Seven Samurai. Ooh, we are in church. We should move on. The Sabbath is a memorial of what? I need some young people to help me out with this. Um, I saw Ian's hand. I'll, I'll give a couple answers, and then we'll come back to you, Ketsia. Okay, so let's go to Ian first. Creation. Creation is one of them, Ketsia. Come back up here to Ketsia for me, would you, Toby? Ketsia, was you, were you going to say creation? Yeah. Okay, there's another one up there. Can you, can you guess which one it might be? Go, go say it in the mic. It's not judgment, but yeah, I can see how that would be. All right, this young man right here. Um, redemption? <laughs> you said that with such confidence. Redemption? No, that's right. You are correct. Redemption. Creation and redemption. We'll have one more, one more question, Mitch and, and Toby. But I just want to illustrate this. The, the Ten Commandments are, are listed twice in the Bible, and the Sabbath commandment is stated a slightly different in the two. The reasons are different. Exodus says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and sea and all that's in the heavens and the earth to see and all that's in them. In Deuteronomy's version, though, Moses says there's an additional reason that the Sabbath has significance. You shall remember, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord brought you out of there. So the Sabbath is both a memorial of creation and also a remembering of what God has done in redemption and in salvation. All right. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The Sabbath is also called what in the Bible? The Lord's Day, the Holy Day, the Day of Assembly, Day of Delight, Day of Rest. Okay, can we come over here? We've had a lot of saturation in this side of the church. We don't want to get off balance, so we're going to come. Which, whichever, I didn't see who raised their hand first. Uh, the Holy Day? The Holy Day, yes, that's correct. And is this London again? Kylan, I am sorry. I'm still learning names here, guys. I apologize. Mitch, can we come to Kylan too? Right here? Yeah. 
The day of rest. The day of rest. That's also correct. All right. One more answer. So two of them are correct. All right. I'll, can we have Sean have a chance? The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. Okay. Here, if you haven't been around Pastor Dave a whole lot, sometimes there's little things you can learn. When there's a list like this, it's usually all of them. <laughs> I didn't give you an option that said all of the above, but uh, um, it's all of them. So thank you, everyone who participated. Yeah, you can just set the mics on the front pews. That would be fine. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Toby. Appreciate your help. So I want to just uh, show you a couple of places where the Sabbath is given these additional ways of identifying. Here in Isaiah 58, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Now just keep that in mind. Jesus, or excuse me, the Bible, God, and Isaiah says that the Sabbath is my day, my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. Now, that's more of a, uh, an attitude to have on the Sabbath than a title for the Sabbath, but I still think it's appropriate to say the Sabbath is also a day of delight, the holy day. And again, I want you to see it's not a holy day. It's not some kind of a holy day. Uh, the Bible says the holy day of the Lord honorable and, desiring your, and not desiring your own ways from seeking your own pleasure and seeking your own word. Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's a lot of uh, ways that the Bible refers to the Sabbath there in Isaiah 58, calling it my holy day, the holy day, a day of delight. Um, Leviticus and Numbers, those two books use this uh, language. I just chose one verse here from Leviticus 23. But both Leviticus and Numbers use this repetitive way of calling the Sabbath a holy convocation. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there's a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation, meaning a sacred assembly. Don't do any work. It's a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. So the Sabbath is not just a day to rest. It is a day to assemble. And is a, it could be argued that to not assemble on the Sabbath is to miss an important element of what the Sabbath means to us. So um, I, I think that that is uh, evident in the passage as well. And then in the New Testament, Jesus identifies himself as Lord of the Sabbath. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Um, does the Sabbath matter? How much does it matter? Why does it matter? This last uh, series we've looked at, um, and it cut off. Uh, it cut off the other one. This is creation. We've looked at the the teaching of creation and how it relates to our faith and why it's so important. We've looked at the cross, and then last week we talked about prophecy and how prophecy is not. Uh, a luxury in our life. It is really an essential part of our faith journey in studying and understanding prophecy. Do you know what these three things have in common? What, what ties these three teachings together? The Sabbath. <laughs> the Sabbath. The Sabbath is like a golden thread weaving its way throughout the entire Bible, pulling together uh, the journey and spiritual reality of the people of God. You'll find the Sabbath uh, emphasized in the prophets at Mount Sinai, throughout prophecy in the book of Revelation. It's there in the Gospels in the New Testament church. It's emphasized first and foremost at creation. And you'll even see the Sabbath elevated and exemplified at the cross. The Sabbath is, is not just one, like, side teaching. It seems to be this corridor of faith traveling throughout the Scriptures and tying together God's plan of salvation. I didn't grow up a Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up a Christian. So many of you have heard uh, my story, and I, I make reference to it here and there. I grew up reading my Bible. I grew up loving my Bible. Uh, I think I shared um, when Gene and I talked about our journey to becoming Seventh-day Adventist. I was that, that young man, Ryden. I was like that young man, kind of like you, that uh, all the grandmas in the church would come by and pat on the head and say, we got a little preacher here. We got a little preacher here. 
I was the, the, the type of kid that, that really loved to study and, and to know things about God and about faith and teachings and doctrine. But I'd never studied the Sabbath before. And I'll never forget when it was first presented to me in a comprehensive manner, when it was a, a subject of, of great import that went through a Bible study, I was amazed at how much the Sabbath is taught and emphasized from the beginning of the Bible to the end. I couldn't believe how I didn't see it and how I had been a lover of Scripture and a lover of Jesus and a follower of the Bible and wanting to understand the things of God, and I'd never seen it before. And by the way, I don't think I'm the only non-Saturday Sabbath-keeping Christian that has that experience. A lot of Christians just believe and, and take take in, you know, kind of that's what's given them in church, and if they're not expected to expand or challenge into other areas, they'll never go into them. So that's a common thing that we go through, but the Sabbath is all throughout Scripture, and it should stand as uh, a something of significance for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to illustrate how the Sabbath ties together creation, the cross, and prophecy. Many of these passages you'll be very familiar with, and maybe you've thought of these in these contexts before. I don't know. Here's, here's how God uh, discusses and expresses the original uh, uh, language of the Sabbath. Here in Genesis, after creation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, "...thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts..." Some of your Bibles don't use the word completed. In the King James, New King James, a few other versions, it says finished, Okay? So Genesis 2.1, the Bible says, it was finished. It was finished. Keep that in mind. And by the seventh day, this is the first reference, God completed His work which He has done. And after His work, He declared His finished. By the seventh day, He had completed His work. And He rested on the seventh day. This is now the second reference to the seventh day from all His work which He had done, because it was finished. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day, third reference, and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. So this one is, a, 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 as far as the tie-in to creation, we already mentioned during the kids' quiz that the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. So there's no stretch to see that right at the beginning of our Bibles, right at the beginning of creation, God establishes an order for the believers. God establishes a plan for His children that on the seventh day, they were to come along together with God and rest. And I mentioned this, I went to a, um, uh, at the church last night, Nassim, at Chandler Spanish Church, um, that it's interesting that mankind's first full day with God was a Sabbath day. Mankind's first day of relationship and life was the Sabbath day, resting not in their own work because they didn't done anything yet. They'd just been created. They rested with God, acknowledging and trusting that His work the following week had been completed. And by faith, they weren't there. By faith, they trusted that God, their creator, had done all the previous work and then on the Sabbath rested with them and invited them into relationship with their own creator. So their first full day of life is the Sabbath. So the Sabbath tie to creation is, is mentioned, it's memorialized in the law, it is emphasized, it's there. But notice this parallel to the cross as well. God's works were finished. In John 19.30, when Jesus hung on the cross, what was his final words? It is finished. And by the way, in the Greek, the word finished is the exact same word in John 19 as it is in Genesis 2, teleo. It's the exact same word. Jesus Christ, when He hung on the cross, He makes the same declaration that He Himself had made thousands of years prior when the earth was finished and completed. He said the same thing. It's finished. 
Well, what was finished? Well, at creation, it was the creation of the world. What was finished at the cross? The work of Christ becoming the perfect sacrifice for the redemption of our sins was finished. So at both creation and at redemption, God cries out, it is finished. Then God, in Genesis, he rests on the seventh day from the work in which he had done. Jesus Christ also rested after he died on the cross. He slept in the tomb. Jesus rested in the tomb on the seventh day. Even in Jesus kept the Sabbath in his life and in God's uh, uh, sovereign plan, he even kept the Sabbath in his death. He rested from his work of saving the world. He slept in the tomb and then rose on Sunday morning to continue his work of intercession for our behalf. And the seventh day is repeated in triplicate there in Genesis 1. This is going to tie in a little bit more to prophecy. The first time a number is repeated in the Bible is the seventh day. The seventh day. The seventh day. Now, again, I know these are ordinal numbers and not cardinal numbers, but still, seven, seven, seven is the first time a number is repeated in Scripture. I just think that's ironic. Are there other numbers that are significant prophetically that are repeated in triplicate? So right here at the beginning, the Sabbath, the seventh day, creation, redemption, are tied together. Notice here when it comes to the cross, it was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. This is after Jesus had died. Now the women saw the tomb and how the body of Jesus was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. They wanted to anoint and do the, uh, the, the, the Jewish custom of preparing and, and making the body appropriate for burial. They prepared the spices and perfumes, but on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So Jesus dies on the cross just as Friday is ending and as Sabbath is beginning. Even in his death, the Sabbath is acknowledged and experienced. Now notice this also. Uh, you'll see this many times in the Bible, and I'm going to show you several of them. Here in Ezekiel, a couple, chapter, a couple verses, um, chapter 20, verse 12 and 20. Uh, God says, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Okay? The Sabbath is a sign of God's sanctification. Where did God's sanctification become realized and manifest? The cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says that God, Jesus became the wisdom of God to us because of his crucifixion, and he became to us sanctification and righteousness because of his crucifixion. The Sabbath, God says, looking down through, now, before Jesus died on the cross, it would have been the sanctuary service that they would think about. But the sanctuary service was just a model, just a shadow of what the reality of the sacrifice of Christ would be. So even before the cross, God would say in the Old Testament that the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's sacrifice bringing sanctification to you. Verse 20, sanctify my Sabbaths that they may be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath emphasizes that God in heaven is our sovereign king. It illustrates, it indicates to all the world, to ourselves, to our family, to all heavenly agencies that we belong to God. And it's only because of the cross that we can make such a claim. Two more times in the book of Exodus, you shall surely observe my Sabbath, for, they, for this is a sign, third time now, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And here's the fourth time. A few verses later, it is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but the seventh day he ceased from, labor, his, from his labor and was refreshed. Four times, no less. The Bible says that the Sabbath is a sign. It's a sign. Now note for a minute, the Sabbath, the Sabbath itself does not sanctify us. Okay? By me resting from my labor and coming to church and worshiping God, that is not what sanctifies me. That's not what I'm going to be able to go to the gates of heaven and say, okay, Lord, let me in. You see, I've done it, sir. I kept the Sabbath. You got to let me in. No, the Sabbath is a sign. It's an indicator. It's an example. It's an illustration. It's a witness that God has sanctified us. 
When we keep the Sabbath, we are acknowledging the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Are you with me? We are not nullifying it. We are exemplifying it. Just as He rested, so also do we rest. We rest in Christ's completed work every Sabbath. That's what we do. We are resting in His work. We say on the Sabbath, Lord, it is not I who am saving myself. No works of mine. My works are as filthy rags. As important as they are, as necessary as we should let the Holy Spirit guide us into good works, they are not sufficient to our salvation. Every Sabbath we acknowledge before God, all of my works are not sufficient. All of my efforts will not satisfy. Only Jesus completed works of both my creation and my recreation establish my hope of eternal life in heaven. We rest in Christ's completed works every Sabbath. Now notice this, the other tie into the, to prophecy and to revelation. What day was it that John received the revelation vision? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Just by accident, God rolled the dice, came out seven, You'd have to have an interesting dice for that, right? Okay? It was on the Lord's day, and Jesus himself said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. And in Isaiah 58, he calls the Sabbath my holy day. Now, I know that a century later, the church would call the Lord's day Sunday. But that was not what John was meaning when he wrote this passage. That reference was not in use in John's day. A century later it would be, and we have good historical evidence of the church beginning to call Sunday the Lord's Day, but that would have been completely foreign to the apostles and to the writers of the New Testament. There's only one day throughout the Bible that God says is my day, and it's the holy day, my holy Sabbath. So John himself receives the vision of the day of the Lord on the Lord's day because Revelation is a vision of the final day of God. So he receives the vision of the day of the Lord on the Lord's day. Did you get that, Mitch? I'll write it down for you and we can talk about it later. It's very interesting. And again, we talked 55 times God's number of perfection and creation and redemption the number seven is emphasized. And then it's very interesting, and we can spend a lot of time talking about the mark of the beast and the meaning of the number and the wisdom of uh, those who have wisdom know the meaning of the, the number of his name. But it is interesting that in the last book, the number representing false religion and representing man's attempt to save themselves is 666. Where right at the beginning of the Bible, God says, if you want to know my plan for you, if you want to know my way of uh, wanting to have a relationship with you, it is through the experience of the seventh day, the seventh day, and the seventh day. Man was created on the sixth day. So the works of man and man attempting to save himself could be considered what the 666 also means. Man's attempt to say, I'm going to save myself. I was made on the sixth day. I'm going to do my own thing. Whereas God says, you've got to rest in me. You've got to rest in me. And any anytime, time you reject my work on your behalf, you're trying to do it on your own. And that is the triplicate 666. There's a lot of other things uh, that these numbers and these symbols can mean. But I find that very interesting. And then finally, the Sabbath command is directly quoted in the book of Revelation. It's at least a portion of it. In Revelation 14.8. Now notice... Um, Oh, none of my transitions are working. I guess uh, well, sometimes when it goes from screen to screen, it gets messed up. Uh, we've mentioned this verse several times, Revelation 12, 17. The identifying mark of the church that would be the target of the dragon and his wrath are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. A few verses later, in Revelation 14, 12, the very same identifying marks are expressed about those who will um, uh, receive the third angel's message and be able to, to be ready for the second coming of Christ. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So it's kind of like an Oreo cookie, okay? You got the two uh, cookies on either side, right? You've had an Oreo before. Just want to make sure this illustration won't work if you don't know what an Oreo cookie is, okay? You got the two sides of the cookie, and then what's in the middle? 
You got the cream. I don't even know what the stuff is. It's probably a terribly unhealthy. I don't even think it's, you know, comes from nature. I think it's born out of a laboratory somewhere. But that white cream in the middle, right? That's the good stuff. That's the gooey stuff. So you got, you got the two sides. You keep the commandments. Those are the cookies. And in the middle, you have the Sabbath command expressly referenced in the first angel's message. Fear God and give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. That is a direct quote in the Greek. You could take that, you could take a, uh, oh, actually, I think I put it on the screen. I'm going to say you could take a, your scissors and cut it out. Here's the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament of Exodus 20, 11, the Sabbath command, and here's Revelation 14, 7. And the same, ton thuranon kai ten gain kai ten thalassen. That's how it's said. Now, I could have said whatever I wanted, and you'd have to believe me. Ton uranon kai ten gan kai thalassen. The one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea. It's the exact same quote. The writer here does not do this by accident. The Holy Spirit does not inspire uh, John by accident. He puts the two uh, sides of the cookie on either side, and he says the last day people are going to be commandment-keeping people. Oh, and by the way, when you worship him, when you fear him, when you recognize that the hour of his judgment has come, you will honor him as the creator God and the one who's given us the Sabbath day directly referenced and quoted on the Lord's day from the little horn who's trying to change times and laws. Why does the Sabbath matter? All relationships are based on trust, aren't they? Or lack thereof. Good relationships based on faithful trust. The Sabbath creates time, rest, and community in which our trust, our faith, and God has developed and established. Again, don't get out of your mind. The first day of life of an experience with God in, in this planet was God worshiping with His children on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. Remove the Sabbath. Why do you think the devil hates the Sabbath so much? Why does he try to create so much confusion? Why does he attack it in the last days? Because it's within the context of that rest and that worship and that community that our faith is built. Without that, we have nothing. We have nothing. That's why it's more than just a day. It is the Lord's day. Creation, going all the way to Revelation, it's there at Sinai, it's there at Calvary, and throughout all of Scripture, you'll see the golden thread of the Sabbath tying things together. God said, I gave them my Sabbaths that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. That's why the Sabbath matters. Without the Sabbath, we're trying to do it on our own, and we're doing it in opposition to what God's plan is for our lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I know I kind of ran through that quickly, touched on a lot of things, jumped around a bit in the passages of Scripture. Father, it's not as important what I say here as it is what you speak to every heart that's here, Lord. Father, we thank you for your Scriptures. We thank you for the clarity that you give us. And even though it takes study and it takes digging, and it takes digesting and searching the Scriptures. We are rewarded so richly when we see your truth revealed to us. God, I pray for those of us who've grown up believing these things, it may not seem as significant. We've just always done it, and we may sometimes wonder what's the point. Lord, I pray that you would solidify in our hearts that it's not just a tradition, it's not just a a thing that we do that is just unique to us, but it is of powerful import. Lord, for those of us who came into this later in life, or maybe we're hearing this almost uh, brand new for the first time, Lord, I pray that each of us would search the Scriptures to see if these things ring true 
as your Holy Spirit guides us. Because, God, we know that a war is going on, a war to destroy our faith in you. So, God, help us. Help us here in Scottsdale. Help us in the Phoenix area, in the state of Arizona, to accept the sign of your sanctification on that day of delight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, everyone, again for being here. We'll have a potluck in our fellowship hall here momentarily, and uh, hope that you have a blessed day. God bless.